Welcome to Tech Talent Today, where IT leaders share their tough challenges, creative solutions, and latest insights. You'll discover fresh ideas and inspiration here with your host, IT staffing veteran and president of Claremont Technologies, Jody Kulik Mayer. And now, here's Jody. The pandemic reshaped our office culture, pushing us from traditional setups to more flexible and remote friendly approaches. While return to office is being mandated by many employers to varying degrees this year, it's evident that hybrid work is here to stay. Today, I'm thrilled to have Luigi Petalino on the show. He's the vice president of product delivery at a leading national insurance firm and has spent most of his 25 year career in the insurance industry in technology roles. We're diving deep into the nitty gritty of managing IT talent in this world of hybrid work environments. Luigi's extensive career spans the insurance industry, financial services firms, and a nonprofit organization. With a bachelor's in civil engineering from the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art and an MBA in financial economics and international business from Pace University, Luigi brings invaluable expertise from 18 years of managing teams in the greater New York area. So as companies navigate the shift from traditional office settings to flexible and remote friendly approaches, Luigi offers valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities this transformation presents. Welcome, Luigi. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Very excited to uh, talk about uh, things that are near and dear to my heart. Right, right. Yes, return to the office. <laughs> Though you didn't have to return, you've already been there, right? Yep, here I am. Yeah. So let me ask you, before the pandemic, what was the situation? Were pe was people like working five days in office or how was it beforehand, the before times? <laughs> In general, so I have a staff of about 30. Half of my staff is based in the US and half of it is based in India. So we have a captive in India uh, for the company I work for. And in general, I could say three quarters of my US, US based staff was based here in New Jersey where I'm located. And about a quarter of them were working remotely. So that was again, pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, most people work remotely, but in a hybrid environment where my New Jersey staff comes in voluntarily two days a week. That was, a, that I was going to ask that, right? Are they coming in because it's a mandate or voluntarily? Yeah. Yeah. So my company at this point has made it such that the employee can decide whether they want to work remotely or not. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's not true of many companies where it's like they actually mandate you need to be in two days a week or three days a week or whatever the case may be. So uh, our CEO says, well, if as long as you're working, come, you know, you can do what you want. Um, I actually choose to come into the office. You know, I could talk about that, you know, later, but the um, most staff has decided, and again, and I work for an insurance company, so they've decided to work remotely from home. But of course, that comes with lots of challenges. Yeah, what, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, go into that. Okay, so part of the challenge of being in a re working remotely is that you've lost the camaraderie of an office. I think that a lot of problems get solved over the quote unquote water cooler. You know, again, I'm, uh, I may look young, but I'm not that young. So, <laughs> um, you know, people do get ideas from each other and working remotely, even though you have lots of technology available to you, you still lose a little bit of that human interaction. Sort of like, hey, like, how are you doing? Like, what are your kids up to? I think that when you work remotely all the time, you schedule time on your calendar specifically for a meeting, and some of those other conversations that make human connections have disappeared. So that's part of the challenge of being in a hybrid environment. Uh, training is a big issue too, mm -hmm. because there's only so much you can do over video conferencing. 
Um, and I think I know when we spoke, you wanted to talk about that a little bit more, but I'd say these are some of the, a few of the major challenges. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of people look at working remotely as, you know, in a selfish manner, it's like, well, this is great, better for me. But um, if you look at the news yesterday, UPS laid off 12,000 people. They said that they're going to do that over the course of the next uh, quarter, I think. Mm -hmm. And one of the parts of the, high, of the headline says that they're requiring people to come into work five days a week because they've, I think, like they're down 10% in, uh, I don't know if it was revenue or profitability. So it's like, if you're making money, Companies are going to say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If we're losing money, this is going to be the one area where people say, well, I think it's time to get people back into the office to talk to each other. I mean, they may, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the reason why you lost money, but I have a feeling that it's going to be one of the main things that are brought up in terms of you know why mandates are going to be uh, implemented. Right. I am also seeing a lot of mandates in the marketplace in financial services firms, four and five days a week. So it, it is look like the pendulum is swinging back to how it was. Yeah. So not uh, at your company so far. No, and, and you know, and I'm sure that people listening to this or watching this are gonna say, well, my company does this or, you know, which is a complete 180 than another company. And I really think it's at this point, company by company situation where they're going to determine what is necessary. Now, you see some IT talent that says, well, if the company mandates that I have to come in five days a week, I'm going to quit or I'm not going to apply to that company. And that's fine. And everyone can do whatever they want. But when you look at it from an economic standpoint, uh, if we, if and when, and really the question is when, because this is always going to happen, we have a major recession. And if it affects the technology space, more than likely, if you are forced, you know, if you need to pay your mortgage or pay your rent, you will go back into the office if that's what the requirement is of the job. And that, I think, was, is the pendulum swing. Now, does that mean that we're going to go back to the way things were before the pandemic, where, you know, let's say, and I don't know what the exact numbers are, but let's say, you know, 10 to 15% of the workforce was already working remotely. Now you have more like 75% of the workforce working remotely. I mean, I don't think you'll go back to 15%, but I can definitely see companies mandating at least three days a week. I mean, I mean, and that's not even looking at the commercial real estate aspects of the problem, because, you know, if you have, it, for example, in Manhattan, 20 Empire State Buildings worth of available real estate, well, that's going to affect the market. And it's not very easy for you to convert that to residential space because that you know, it seems to be thrown out to a lot of people. It's like, oh, we'll turn them all into apartments. Uh, it's not as easy as it seems. Right, right. So you said that your team comes in two days a week voluntarily. Is that everyone that comes in or mo most or what? Most of my New Jersey-based staff, yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they do that is so that they can learn from each other. You know, part One of the, the questions that you had asked me was, how do people learn in this type of environment? And during the pandemic, there was a, a downtick in, in the quality of the work because people weren't sure like what to do. And it was like, well, I need to talk to this person or this person. And there was, only, there was only so much that could be done over video conferencing. So uh, they came in and, you know, and I try to, I try to, as a manager, make it fun. We'll maybe go out to lunch more often. You know, being in a suburban office, we go out for walks together. Uh, we've done a couple of team building exercises, like an escape room, for example. Uh, my company also, uh, the division I work in, sponsors a once a year offsite. So... We go to uh, another city far away. Uh, like we went to the West Coast our first year, and that was two years ago, where it was like you spend a day just listening to what each department within your division is doing, and then the rest of it was, hey, um, like meet your teammates. Uh, one of the exercises we did was like a speed dating exercise. Oh, fun. Where, where you would 
have, and we were approximately, I guess, 500 people. And you were given a number and it's like you go to a table and you spend 15 minutes and you have to meet people from not just within our division, other departments. And it's like, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is how long I've worked for the company. A couple of fun facts about me. And I've learned a lot. And it's made it easier because especially when you work in IT, you end up working with most people in the company. So uh, putting names with faces and um, I guess it sort of breaks down that barrier of being afraid to pick up the phone because right. I think there's a, there's a, there's an over-reliance to at this point, chat and email. I and totally it's agree. very, it's very, very impersonal. So being able to speak to someone and seeing, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with someone really makes a difference. Um, I mean, another one anecdotally was a lot of people were very camera shy for quite some time. So then they mandated that we turn our cameras on. And that has changed a little bit of the dynamic. You know, I think some of us uh, enjoyed being in pajamas, right? <laughs> Not <laughs> right. necessarily brushing your hair if you have it, right? But, <laughs> right. but um, it is, there are little things and I'm saying it, it you can still work remotely, but uh, like with anything, it's, it is maybe the perfect way for some people to work. Um, maybe the not perfect way for some people to work. It's like a bell curve. And then it's the middle that, uh, you know, sort of do okay. And everyone has a different set of challenges. Some people are less technically savvy right. um, uh, than others, uh, et cetera. Even like, you know, setting up this podcast wasn't necessarily um, something that uh, most people could figure out how to do if they hadn't done it before. So... I agree with like the phone that people don't pick up the phone anymore. There's so much texting back and forth. Um, there can be a lot of misconstruing, right? I mean, even on the phone, you could misconstrue, but at least you could hear tone and Correct. interact. Um, like I think video is the next best because at least you can see some of the body language. So, you know, it's better than that. Do you feel like it's improved relationships within your team that you have more togetherness? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, for the people who come in, we have a tendency of we'll have birthday cakes and, nice. um, you know, we, we definitely try to make use of the time that we're together and build the relationships. And at the end of the day, everything we do, no matter what our job is, it is about relationships. And like I said, there's a, and when I use the word selfishness, I don't want to, I want to be clear that I'm not using it in a negative connotation. It's like thinking of self. It's like, well, someone can say, it's like, well, it's great for me to work from home because it's easy for me to pick up my kids and it's easier for me to do this. It's easy for me to go to the gym and do these things, and which are all true, but there's a lot of emphasis on yourself. It's like, this is what I need to do. But I feel like as time has gone on, we tend to lose sight of the bigger picture. It's like we're part of the community. It's like, well, uh, I come into the office. I mean, I come in very frequently, four to five days a week. But if I know that, well, you know, I'm not really feeling up to getting in today, I could say, well, you know, it's cold out. I want to stay home. But I know that so-and-so just came up from Florida. And it's probably would be helpful for me to spend 30 minutes with that person face to face because I can make a connection and this project that we're working on together will be completed much faster if we do that. And again, and that's thinking of more than just yourself. You're thinking of your organization, your team, whatever, whatever words you want to put there. Right. Now, what are the challenges that you've found in training junior talent? Great question. Junior talent, I, I use this term. So I manage currently development staff. Junior talent learn a skill. Hopefully they've learned some skills in college. But what I always say is they create what, what I call an application in a box. And they can build an application that will run on their computer. Right. And the experience that they lack is how do you work in an enterprise? You know, we all have HR systems. We all have accounting and billing systems. You know, uh, everything needs to talk to each other. I need to be able to 
talk to, you know, let's say my uh, directory services. Mo most people use Active Directory. It's Azure nowadays. So you need that experience to be able to build things effectively. And how do you learn that? Well, you learn that from people who are senior on your team, people who've been working for a few years. It's like, well, th this is where you find this and this is where you find that. And they want those skills. And it's interesting in the, in the office here, since I am in frequently, like I've met people from out, even inside and outside my division who I normally wouldn't meet, like when we had a fully occupied building. Uh, and some of the younger people are actually coming in three days a week voluntarily. And the reason why they're doing it is like, well, it's like, I want to learn. Um, there's this term uh, that some may have uh, um, encountered, it's called proximity bias. And what proximity bias means is that if you are in proximity of your manager or people who are, um, let's say, the higher ups in an organization, well, if they see you, they're going to say, oh, I can give this person a job. Oh, I see this person all the time. I'll give them a raise. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing better work than someone who's working remotely, but the fact that you're in someone's face just means that they'll be biased to you. And um, they've sort of caught on to that. I mean, I give credit to those who have that because, again, it's just one thing that helps them get ahead. It's like, I mean, if it works for them, might as well do it. Right. Now, do you have any formal like mentorship program or do you just take people under your wing? How, like, How do you work that there? Great question. So my company has a mentorship program. Uh, we've started and stopped it over the last few years. Uh, I actually mentored someone. It was actually nine years ago within the company. And we still talk once a month, nine years later. Uh, she and I, she's at actually the same level, if not higher than me now. But uh, it's interesting to see the progression. It's like, have someone who doesn't necessarily have, who didn't have at the time managerial experience and then see that person, you know, graduate to different levels so that now it's more collegial in the sense that, hey, you know, what did you do? What am I doing? Um, within the company, we have, again, mentorship programs. I think that I try to be a mentor to my employees, but I, so, I say to them, it's like, you should look for someone besides your manager to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like people come and seek me out. It's like, hey, like I, I need some advice. Uh, and sometimes it's like, well, you just get assigned someone. Uh, I'm mentoring someone who uh, works in Maryland uh, for, another, for another division within my company, young uh, gentleman. And you know, mm -hmm. it's like, He's like, hey, how do I navigate? Like, how do I negotiate a raise or a promotion? Uh, I'm having trouble getting this done. Who do I talk to? You know, and you know, it's going to be, I mean, I also, when I look at mentorship, I think a true mentor has to look at you both professionally and personally. So it could be something like, well, if you if you have aspirations to be at this spot you know, within five years, I mean, what have you done to, you know, have you looked at what are the credentials to get there? You know, it could be educational, it could be uh, technical, uh, it could be developmental. One of the mistakes I think most people know is uh, the, the best technical resource doesn't necessarily mean that's the best managerial resource. So uh, if someone's on, been on a technical track for many years and all of a sudden, that person says, well, I'd like to take, you know, dip my toes into the world of management. It's like, okay, well, that requires probably a little bit of training, uh, a little bit of working with someone else who has been a manager for many years. I mean, there's that, I mean, there's also a person having an aptitude for being a people person. And so it's not, uh, again, you know, I think we always have a tendency. It's like, well, you know, the, the, so and so who got a 4.0. I think like we have this drilled in our heads when we're when we're younger. It's like the the person who has the perfect grade in college is going to be the um, CEO, captain of industry, multimillionaire, and quite frankly, it's usually not. It it it's usually the people who actually have good communication skills, right? And uh, especially technical resources are notorious for not having very good communication skills. I uh, occasionally 
like once or twice a year, I either speak like at the high school level on a career day or college. And people ask me, well, you know, if you could go back and, and do things differently, what would you tell your younger self? And what I, I reflected on it once and I, I said this, I, I remember I went back to my high school and I said, you know, don't hide behind your success. Focus on your failures or what you're not good at. Like, in, in other words, if you're really good in math, don't join the math club. You should probably go to the drama club because if you're really good at math, you're always going to be good at math. Right. You know, and those who are in the drama club probably need, need some help in math. math. <laughs> you know, and that's really what it is to be educated. And that that is, I think, truly the mark of success. It's like don't focus on what you're good at because you'll always be good at that. It's like work on those things that you're not good at. And uh, I mean, for someone who has an engineering background, uh, a lot of math and science, I would have, fo I should have focused more on English. And I think that, um, you know, again, English communication, again, written, you know, verbal, all that stuff. That is what you need to be successful, you know, right. in my opinion, as maybe some people might disagree, but uh, yeah. that's my general philosophy. I do agree with that. I also think there's like, like an empathy piece and like the connection piece as part of the communication, right? Also that you're oh. listening as part of the communication as well, like the whole, and it's hard to do all those things. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember I was, uh, I mean, I, I spoke at my high school a few years ago and this one alumna who was much younger than me, who graduated just a few years prior, but I think it was maybe like four years prior. Um, and we started speaking and she was she was studying engineering at Hofstra. So we exchanged information. A year later, she reached out to me. It's like, hey, would you mind speaking to a women in engineering you know, group? You know, because you know, we're trying to explore careers outside of engineering. And I, you know, I studied to be a civil engineer. It's a long story how I got into technology. So uh, I'll leave that for another day. But um, I remember they seemed a little intimidated at first as I started talking. And, you know, what this uh, young lady said to me was, well, just remember most of the people, most of the women here are uh, immigrants. So I was like, okay. So then I started to speak. I was like, hey, I'm a child of immigrants. I know what it's like to have parents who don't speak English as their first language. I know what it's like to be their caretakers, you know, when buying a home or doing their taxes because you're doing that at a very young age, you're acting as a translator and you have to be an adult a lot sooner than someone who is native born. And I remember all of a sudden it's like their faces started to smile and like, you know, they sort of lit up. And at that point they just started like hammering me with questions. Like we went from like just silence at the beginning, you know, and I tried a few jokes just to lighten things up, but all of a sudden it's like, Hey, he understands what I'm talking about. You know, again, I'm empathizing with you. I understand where you're coming from. So now let's have a discussion. And I will say like, even after we finished that session, it was like an hour long session. A few months later, I mean, a few of them had reached out to me, like asking me questions. It's like, hey, I'm contemplating this type of career. Like, what do you think? Like, if what, what can I do to get there? You know, again, I, I gave it my best shot. <laughs> Um, whether or not they were successful, um, I guess, to be seen, but I think they are. Right. Well, you made the connection, right? So you broke down the barrier. So they felt comfortable, like really talking about what's on their mind. And I, I think that's the key, right? Because sometimes when you're not agreeing with somebody or just having an issue, you like have to get to what the real issue is and they have to feel comfortable talking to you and you, then you have to work it out and navigate so, yeah. And I really think that the, what it comes down to is people generally don't like conflict. Yes. And what I value is critical thinking. When you're in a room and everyone is agreeing, you actually need to step back and ask yourself, is this a good thing? 
And what I tell my staff all the time is, I don't need you to agree with me all the time. I actually want you to poke holes at my assumptions. Because what I find is when everyone is agreeing, it's like, you know, they're maybe looking at one side of the problem. So what I'll do is I'll consciously say, it's like, all right, well, what if this was a scenario? What is that? What, what if this happened? What if this happened? Does that break down sort of the design, you know, or the process that we thought is the perfect process? Remember, there's no perfection in life, right? That's for sure. Uh, so <laughs> what if you can challenge those things and again and at least i mean your job then is like well if i'm challenging someone you know the response should be like well did you, i took this into account i took this into account or i didn't think of this that is really what you want from your staff it's like you want them to think you know again in a respectful manner they want you want them to challenge assumptions and make sure that hey what we discussed is the best possible solution given all of the constraints, you know, and all of the assumptions and all the givens that we have in front of us. Uh, and I think that there's a tendency, especially of bosses, not managers or leaders really, saying it's like, well, ignore everything, what everyone's telling you, ignore what you're thinking, just do what I tell you to do. And usually those people aren't very successful. Right, I agree. Though hearing, like the qualities that you're looking for makes me wonder when you're interviewing, what qualities are you looking for? And then a second part to that question is have the qualities that you look for changed in the hybrid world? The second part of your question, no. Mm -hmm. And what do I look for? I do look for critical thinking. Uh, I will, I mean, again, in a technical interview, I will ask questions about, well, do you have experience in the technologies that I'm looking for? Some people on their resume will lie. You know, just because you heard a term, they put it on their resume because that's why they, and they hope that that's why I will want to talk to them. Uh, if And normally what I do in an interview is I will actually bring on the interview one of my very senior technical people with me, almost like a good cop, bad cop. And we have two, there's there's two sides to the interview. So it'd be like, okay, well, you say you know how to, you know, program in this language. So then we'll dig really deep. It's like, well, and if the person can't answer some of the questions, like on a fundamental level, again, and I don't expect everyone to know everything. Um, and it's like, well, it's like, well, I just, uh, I saw it once. I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's not, it's not what I'm looking for. I need somebody who's maybe spent a year in this. So again, I mean, you don't try to make it too difficult. But then I ask really then again on the critical thinking side is the personal qualities. It's like, I I actually appreciate when someone says, it's like, well, do you know this? And they'll say, no, not really. I, I've never really worked on that, but I'm interested in trying. Like, okay, good attitude. Uh, I, I'll ask a question. It's like, well, where do you want to be five years from now? And I know like it's a, it's a very stock question, but if the person says to me, it's like, well, I really want to grow from being like a junior developer. It's like, I'd like to be a lead developer in five years time. It's like, okay, great. So I see person has some gumption, like they have some goals. So then the next question will be, well, what do you think your career path is going to be like? Like, what is that going to look like? I mean, just because you're sitting at a job for five years, doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to be deserving a promotion. Are you bettering yourself? Are you taking maybe some kind of boot camp? Are you maybe pursuing like a graduate degree? You know, I mean, what what are you doing? Like, again, if it's a very technical role, I, or even in a managerial role, it's like, well, you know, I, I would like to be a leader on this project. It's like, it would be great if maybe in two years from now, I have one or two people who I'm managing, et cetera, so I could learn, you know, again, and they have a roadmap and that's what I'm looking for. Um, yeah, the, the worst thing I want to hear from someone is, well, you know, when I go home, uh, you know, I, I want to spend all of my free time playing video games. Right. It's like, okay, well, I mean, okay, I understand you want to unplug from work, but are you look, I mean, if, if you tell me you want to be 
a CIO in 10 years time, but that's all you want to do. I mean, there's a big disconnect. So I really like to look for people with roadmaps, you know, their own roadmap for success. I mean, I can't tell them what that roadmap is going to look like because it is, it's going to be different from everyone, but at least that they have a sense of, well, if I put in this type of effort, I hope that this will be the result. Right. That right there. Um, they have like a plan to get there. It's not, they're just saying that for the interview. They're really looking to go that way. And you can see by the stories that they tell. Um, now I, I hear that like a lot of Americans are not going to college these days because it's so expensive or whatever the reasons are. Now, what are your thoughts of people who do not have college on their resumes? Great question. I don't believe that college is for everyone. I think one of the things we do in this country is we, we put a lot of focus on college uh, to the detriment of a vocational uh, course. I mean, like, you know, you could become a plumber or electrician. I mean, you need to learn some kind of trade or some kind of skill. But I also feel that, especially with as the years have gone on and, you know, not that I want to sound ageist, but as I said earlier, I value critical thinking. I see less and less critical thinking with the younger generations. Uh, I hope that I'm wrong. I, you know, you also hear about great inflation. It's like, well, you know, I, I went to this school versus that school. There's some people who take a boot camp and you know learn a programming language and they do very very well i think that if you go to college you know the purpose of you being in college is to learn to learn i remember the dean of my uh, engineering school used to say that and I, I don't think i appreciated it as much back then as i do today If you go to a four-year, you know, if you have if you go to a four-year college, whether it's public or private, you should be able to come out and be able to continually learn. You know, because that's why it's like when you graduate, it's called commencement. It's like it's not the ending of something, it's the beginning of something new. And I feel like Some people just go and it's like, well, I just paid this money. I got a diploma and I didn't really learn anything. And, you know, and that's, that happens sometimes. Um, I mean, someone who goes to community college might, I, I find some people who went to community college are better than someone who is at an Ivy League. But what I found is that the purpose of being like formally educated is to prepare you for that. Uh, I mean, I think one of the when I used to manage infrastructure resources, up until recently, I mean, again, it's been like five years, but even up until six years ago, I would see resumes of people who still had, it's like, well, I have, I'm NT4 certified. And I'm like, well, you know, that's, we're talking, that's you know, over 20 years ago that, you know, <laughs> uh, that that was in use. I mean, again, I know that some organizations are probably still running it, but <laughs> it's like, how relevant is that today? And I mean, you would hope that someone has moved on from, you know, an NT4 operating system. So you know, you're always looking for people who can who can continually learn, and it's tough. And that's the reason why I try to ask critical, you know, critical thinking type questions because if they can formulate this, it's like, hey, like I understand there's a process. It's like if you give someone a um, like a coding assignment. It's like, well, you know, it's like, I, I want to see what your coding looks like. And, um, you know, this is a project that should take you two hours. It's like, okay, well, did they approach the problem correctly? Uh, it's getting harder. Uh, you know, artificial intelligent AI, like with chat GPT, uh, a lot of people say, well, like I just plug it in and out, out pops out, uh, some code. And again, you get the, you can potentially get people in the door, but, uh, within a short period of time, you could figure out like who, uh, was it truthful? Right. Is that part of your interview process, giving a coding um, project? Yes, I have done that. Uh, not with everyone. I mean, it also depends on the time. Um, you know, some some 
like languages are hotter than others, uh, depending on like what you're developing. So my team develops on, uh, on the AWS platform, mostly serverless. And there was a big premium on that a few years ago. So it was very hard to find talent. Uh, you know, .NET developers or dime a dozen. I mean, it's been out for a long time. There's a lot of people who know how to do it. You know, again, not to, you know, denigrate it anyway. anyway. It just means, again, there's, you know, it's the laws of supply and demand. <laughs> if there's a lot of demand and very little supply, people can command a premium when it comes to salaries and vice versa. It's true. I even find like in the interviewing space, if the skill set's in demand, sometimes people don't want to take like a a test or do a project and they just say, no, I'm not going to interview for that. So, right. but right. If it's a skill that's uh, more easily found, people will do it. And those people will come to the office five days a week. So that's what I'm seeing in the marketplace, like as a trend. Um, what advice would you give to people when starting a job, like in a hybrid environment, right? You have no relationships. So what would you advise? If you can get into the office, great. If you can't, schedule maybe a 15 minute meeting on your video conferencing platform, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or WebEx or you know whatever, whatever your poison is and introduce yourself. It's like, hi, I just started at the company. This is what I'm gonna do. I understand we're gonna be working together, you know, Maybe something like, I have two cats, I play softball at night. You know, I mean, something, I, I think that people don't make the effort to talk to others and you do need to make those connections in business. And I'd say that that is a very basic and easy thing to do to at least get started. Uh, you know, you don't want, I, I, I look at it. Now, one of the things I do for new employees is I have a buddy system so whoever comes in will be assigned a buddy and I'll be like, okay, well, um, I try to look at what time zone they're in. Like I always try to make sure that somebody who's within the same time zone. I also try to uh, buddy up people who are somewhat similar because then that gives them something to talk about. And, you know, and I encourage them, especially the first few weeks, like, did you guys like maybe schedule an hour meeting together, like talk to each other. And then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll even mention, it's like, Hey, you know, like so-and-so does this. And if that I find like works really well. And as time goes on, I found that, you know, they, they, they actually maintain their buddies <laughs> for a very long period of time because now like they, they make that relationship again, uh, they can't, can't emphasize human connection enough uh, in a work environment. Right. Um, so would that be your parting thought or do you have another parting thought for today? Uh, my parting thought is pay it forward. I think that, again, people generally think of themselves and I think that to be successful requires you to think bigger than yourself. And if you can bestow you know, a, a nickel's worth of wisdom on someone who just walked in the door, it's like, hey, you should do this or check this out, talk to this person, uh, you will plant seeds. And I can't tell you how many people, you know, because I've, I've always, you know, I'm passionate about mentoring. I can't tell you how many people through the years have reached out to me to say, Hey, you know, you gave me a great idea 10 years ago and look where I am today. And I, I take satisfaction in saying, it's like, you know what? I, I made a difference in someone's life and their professional life and maybe their personal life. So, um, I think that you should always pay it forward and think about paying it forward. That's great advice. Luigi, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Tech Talent Today, brought to you by Clearmont Technologies IT Staffing and Search. You can find out more at clearmonttech.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and share. See you next time.